In the PB lecture, we examined the case of positive incentives. We focused particularly in the first two parts of the lecture on positive and economic incentives, and in doing so considered several issues, such as that they reward wrongdoing. In the final part of last week's lecture, we examined the case for legal incentives, focusing on amnesties and offers of exile. This week follows directly on from this. We're going to consider the case for international criminal justice. We're going to look at various legal measures to tackle mass atrocities and serious external conflict. We we'll focus particularly on the International Criminal Court, the ICC for short. So let's start then by looking at the background to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court, and the general development of international criminal justice. It'll help if I say a little bit first though about how international criminal justice compares conceptually to the other options that we've looked at so far in this module. Crucially, they aim to tackle mass atrocities, other forms of aggression, only as a secondary intention. The main aim of international criminal prosecutions is to put those on trial who commit abuses, who commit atrocities, for instance. And it's post hoc, rather than, for the most part, attempting to tackle atrocities directly that are ongoing. So what that means is most of the time the cases are after the event rather than tackling directly ongoing atrocities. Let's look then at international criminal justice. Perhaps most famously after World War II, the Allies put on trial suspected war, crime, war criminals in the Nuremberg trials. More recent is the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY. Like the International Criminal Court that we're going to focus on today, it was based in The Hague. It was established by the UN Security Council in 1993. Its role was to consider abuses during the breakup of Yugoslavia in the early 1990s. The charges that it looked at included grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions, violations of the laws of war, genocide, and crimes against humanity. For a while, the big fish evaded capture by the ICTY. But more recently, it's been able to convict the major Bosnian Serb leaders responsible for many of the mass atrocities during the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. In particular, Radovan Karadzic, was convicted for 40 years imprisonment in 20, on the 21st of March, 24th of March 2016, and Ratko Mladic was sentenced to life in 2017. Mladic's picture is at the top, Karadzic is at the bottom. In the middle there, you've got Slobodan Milosevic. He was famously indicted by the ICTY, but committed suicide whilst on remand in 2006. Two important points about the ICTY. Firstly, its own, it was only ever meant to be temporary. Indeed, it was disbanded in 2017 after its mandate was met. Secondly, it focused on primacy rather than complementarity. Primacy rather than complementarity. What this means is that it wasn't meant to complement domestic court actions in the former Yugoslavia. It was meant to replace them. As we'll see, this differs from the ICC, from the International Criminal Court, the of, that works on the basis of subsidiarity. Another recent, re recent major tribunal is the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the ICTR. This was established by the UN Security Council in 1994. It was based in Arusha, Tanzania. The charges included genocide, unlike other tribunals, as well as crimes against humanity and violations of the Geneva Convention and protocols, and was to some degree modelled after the ICTY, the Yugoslavia model. It indicted 93 people, including high-ranking military and government officials, politicians, businessmen, as well as religious and militia and uh, religious um, figures, militia leaders, and uh, media leaders. A notable conviction 
Was it the interim prime minister, Jean Camba uh, Cambanda, whose image is there, who in 1998 pleaded guilty to genocide? It was the first international criminal tribunal since Nuremberg to issue a judgment against a former head of state. Like the ICTY, it was temporary and closed in 2015. Another temporary court worth flagging up is the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the SCSL. This was set up at the request of the Sierra Leonean government after the extremely brutal war at the end of the 1990s. It's a hybrid of national and international um, tribunal. It's a hybrid of an international national tribunal and it's established between the UN and Sierra Leone. It's now completed this mandate, like the others I've mentioned, with a small residual function still left in Sierra Leone. Now, by far the most famous conviction that this secured was of the Liberian warlord, Charles Taylor, who's pictured here. Extremely brutal warlord, became leader in Liberia, committed atrocities, in both Liberia and Sierra Leone. He's got a very checkered back, background. Apparently he once broke out from prison in the US, he was imprisoned in the US and once broke out from prison, allegedly with the help of the CIA. He's now currently serving a 50 year sentence in a prison in Durham. Now, another form of international criminal justice worth flagging before we get to the ICC is what's called universal jurisdiction. This holds that for certain egregious crimes, what that means is for certain really bad crimes, states can prosecute perpetrators even when the mass atrocities don't occur within their borders. Or even when the perpetrator is not a citizen of that state or is not a victim of that state. So it's got no connection to the state at all. The most high profile case here was the arrest of Augusto Pinochet in his visits to the UK in 1998. A huge story at the time here. More recently, it's been used to convict the former president of Chad, Hissène Habré in Senegal. There's a picture of um, Habré. Let's now turn to the ICC itself. Unlike all of these trials that we've looked at so far, the ICTY, the ICTR, Special Court for Sierra Leone, the ICC is permanent. It is the first permanent trial for international crimes. It is also based in The Hague. It was established by the Rome Statute at a conference in Rome in 1998 and entered into force in 2002 after it received 60 ratifications by countries. It's important to note here that the ICC operates on the basis of complementarity. What this means is it meant to complement domestic courts. If another court has already tried the person, it can only proceed if it's clear that that domestic trial was a kangaroo court. More specifically, it can proceed only if it was clear that the trial was a mock trial used to shield the person from accountability or if standard criminal prosecutions, procedures in criminal prosecutions were not followed. What this means then is that you could see the ICC as the court of last resort. Domestic institutions should prosecute their own criminals involved in mass atrocities, but when they fail to do so for various reasons, because they're worried about lacking the capacity to do so, or it being too domestically difficult, or if they just put on a sh uh, mock trial to try and get their political figures um, Get them over, get, let them get away with it, then the ICC is required to step in. 
Now, important point here. The ICC is not part of the UN. It is not part of the UN. It's a separate body. There are links between the UN and the ICC that we're going to get on in, get onto um, later on, particularly that the UN Security Council can make referrals to the ICC, but it's separate body to the UN. What does the ICC cover? It covers genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. These all clearly relate to mass atrocities and it's conducted several trials on the basis of these already. From 2018, the ICC's jurisdiction has also covered what's called the crime of aggression. This was envisaged in the Rome Statute, but took until 2010 to work out a legal definition of aggression accepted by the states. You can see aggression as essentially the wrongful violation of the rules of jus ad bellum, whereas the other crimes that we've been looking at are all about violating individual specific human rights. Aggression concerns the manifestation violations of the UN Charter. It includes the use of armed force by one state against another state um, without the justification of self-defense or without the cover of UN Security Council authorization. So it includes things such as illegal invasion, occupation, annexation, and blockades. However, it applies mainly to those that have ratified the amendment, which is only about 30 or so states at the moment, and it's not going to be retrospective. So it cannot cover wars prior to this ratification in 2018. What this means is that it could not prosecute the um, states that went to war in Iraq in 2003, the UK and US for a crime of aggression, for instance. The main thing that the ICC has focused on are these other crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity and war crimes. How does the ICC work? This is important detail here. Three ways that a case can be referred. The first is by a state party. So where any of the states that are signed up to the Rome statute can refer a case. Here's a picture of all the states in blue that have signed up to the Rome statute. As you'll see, the US has not. Russia has not, China has not. Lots of states in Sub-Saharan Africa have. South America, they have. So the first is by a state party. One of these states can refer a case. And when, when any of these states in blue, they can refer a case to the ICC. This might be because, for instance, They've got a rebel movement within their borders that they think has been violating their citizens' human rights on a huge scale. Secondly, the UN Security Council can decide to refer a case to the ICC. Thirdly, perhaps most controversial, but also most interesting, is that the prosecutor may initiate investigations by herself, in proprio motu. This means that she can prosecute on her own initiative. She is tasked with analysing the prospective case and deciding whether there's a reasonable basis to proceed, what are called the preliminary investigations. So she's tasked with deciding whether the case is within the jurisdiction of the ICC, whether it is admissible, for instance, whether the case um, is or has genuinely already been investigated by the state in question, whether the case is sufficiently grave to warrant investigation by the ECC, and whether it would be what's called in the interests of justice. Now, it's important here 
to note that the prosecutor can only initiate a case amongst the states that have ratified the Rona statute. So if a state hasn't signed, then it cannot. So who has ratified the Rona statute? 123 countries are, part, are state parties to the Rome statute. Out of the 33 are African, 19 are Asian, 18 are from Eastern Europe, 28 are from Latin America, 25 are Western European and other states. What this means is it's going to be very difficult to get a referral for Syria since it's not a state party. and without the UN Security Council authorising this. Seems very unlikely that it would be authorised given Russia's role in Syria thus far. It's also important to note the ICC does not have any means of enforcement on its own. It relies very heavily on state's cooperation, for instance, to secure the arrests of those that have been indicted. Just to reiterate, these are the three main methods, by state itself, by the UN Security Council, by the prosecutor for amongst those states that have signed up to the ICC. Let's have a look at some of the cases so far then. It has at the moment 10 preliminary investigations. This is where it's looking to see whether a prosecution is warranted or not, within its jurisdiction and feasible. You might see it as a bit like the Crown Prosecution Service. It's looking to see whether there should be a prosecution that's made. Secondly, it conducts actual trials. And there are 13 of these at the moment, 13 cases that are being held, heard at the moment. Now, these 10 preliminary investigations first include Bolivia, where the government has asked it to investigate blockades by the opposition movement that allegedly precluded people from obtaining medical treatment for coronavirus. Although this is viewed as quite potentially problematic politically as a political um, referral. Other places, including um, Colombia, Guinea, Iraq, where it's investigating potential UK abuses, Nigeria, Palestine, the Philippines, where it's investigating their so-called war on drugs, and Ukraine as well as two cases in Venezuela. Now, many of these cases, some of these cases might not in fact make it to trial. If you look at the ICC's website, you'll see that there are several cases that don't fully make it to trial. Now, the 13 cases that are currently being fully investigated that are gonna to go to trial, look, looking like they're going to trial. And some of these are currently in trial. These include in Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Central African Republic, twice, and Mali. In all these situations, the states referred them themselves. That is, they are all state parties. I'll just go through that again so that you're sure that you've got it. So ones where the states have referred themselves include Uganda, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Central African Republic, two cases, and Mali. UN Security Council referrals. These include, at the moment, the situations in Darfur and Libya. In this case, neither Libya or Sudan were state parties, but the Security Council referred them to the International Criminal Court. Thirdly, situations proprio motu, where the um, chief prosecutor has engaged in her own investigations. These include situations in Kenya, Burundi, Cote d'Ivoire, Afghanistan, which includes war crimes by the US and other states, Myanmar, Bangladesh. This is for the um, problematic, uh, for the genocide of the Rohingya and Georgia.
Why did the ICC judges decide to authorize the investigation into the situation in Bangladesh, Myanmar? On 14 November 2019, the judges of pretrial chamber three of the International Criminal Court granted the prosecutor's request to proceed with an investigation in the situation in Bangladesh, Myanmar for the alleged crimes within the ICC jurisdiction. The chamber accepted that there exists a reasonable basis to believe crimes against humanity of deportation across the Myanmar-Bangladesh border and of persecution on grounds of ethnicity and or religion against the Rohingya people may have been committed. These alleged crimes, noting their scale, an estimated 600,000 to 1 million Rohingya were forcibly displaced from Myanmar to neighboring Bangladesh, are of sufficient gravity for the ICC to investigate them. The ICC has jurisdiction over crimes where at least part of the criminal conduct takes place on the territory of a state party. In this situation, while Myanmar is not a state party, Bangladesh ratified the ICC Rome Statute in 2010. Accordingly, if part of the alleged criminal conduct takes place on the territory of Bangladesh, this is sufficient to give the court territorial jurisdiction. The prosecutor may investigate any crime, including crimes other than deportation and persecution, if they are within the ICC jurisdiction and are sufficiently linked to the situation described in the prosecutor's request. The ICC's jurisdiction covers past and future crimes committed since Bangladesh became a state party in 2010. Now, in these investigations, the ICC has indicted several rebel leaders, such as Joseph Kony. head of the Lord's Resistance Army, the LRA, has been operating in northern Uganda um, and the surrounding regions. It's also sought prosecution of current and former heads of state, such as Laurent Kabakko, Omar al-Bashir, Uhuru Kenyatta and Muhammad, Muhammad Gaddafi. Kabakko was in fact convicted, although he was later acquitted. Kenyatta went to trial, but um, was found, uh, uh, was not indicted in the end. Bashir, I'm going to mention in a minute. Gaddafi, of course, was, um, was, was killed in Libya. Now, the first conviction was of Thomas Lubanga from the Democratic Republic of the Congo in March 2012 and was sentenced for 14 years for recruiting child soldiers. The ICC has since convicted Jermaine Katanga, another Congolese rebel, and perhaps most notably, Jean-Pierre Bemba, the former vice president of the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who was jailed in 18 years in March 2016 for war crimes and sexual violence. However, he was later cleared on appeal. In 2016, it convicted Ahmed, um, Ahmed al-Faki al-Mahadi, for nine years for the destruction of cultural artifacts in Timbuktu in Mali. And there's a picture of him at the bottom there. Bemba is in the middle. The manga's at the top. Now, despite the fact that there is the acquittal of Gabango um, and the acquittal of Bemba, Lawrence Gabango, a former leader of the Ivory Coast, was found guilty, but then sentenced to imprisonment was acquitted in what seemed to be a major blow to the ICC. Despite that and the acquittal of Bemba, it keeps going. In 2019, last year, a former Congolese rebel, nicknamed the Terminator, called Bos Bosco Natanga, was arrested and sentenced to 30 years for war crimes and crimes against humanity, including murder, rape, sexual slavery, and using child soldiers. It's currently looking at the possibility of launching an investigation against Omar al-Bashir, who was the former president of Sudan, but was ousted last year in a popular uprising. He was in charge of Sudan during the genocide in Darfur in the mid 2000s. One last point to make about the cases, case of Afghanistan, the US Trump administration has imposed sanctions on ICC court officials who are investigating this case. 
and they denied a visa to the chief prosecutor to visit the US. We will not cooperate with the ICC. We will provide no assistance to the ICC and we certainly will not join the ICC. We will let the ICC die on its own. After all, for all intents and purposes, the ICC is already dead to us. There's a picture of Bashir. Okay, this brings to an end part one of today's lecture.